Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm an assistant professor of clinical sciences at Keck Graduate Institute, and today we will be discussing nutrition and oncology. The reason we are discussing nutrition and oncology today is that oncology patients make up a large portion of the overall specialized nutrition support population. In addition, oncology patients who require nutrition support have special considerations unique to them when receiving feeding. That is why we are discussing these patients today. Our objectives today will be to identify factors leading to malnutrition in oncology patients, to list pharma pharmacological options used to stimulate appetite in oncology patients, to discuss energy and protein requirements in oncology patients, and to debate nutrition support of palliative care oncology patients and palliative care patients as a whole. In regards to epidemiology, in the United States, the incidence of new cancers is approximately 1.7 million cases annually, and that number increases every year that the United States population increases. And as a result of the many new cases and essentially the morbidity and mortality related with cancer, cancer actually accounts for about one in four deaths annually within the United States. From the nutrition support perspective, Cancer is related to a lot of unintended weight loss and progressive deterioration. Um, and in regards to this unintended weight loss, you may see what is known as cachexia or essentially a wasting syndrome that is essentially related to pro-inflammatory processes that happen within cancer. Um, and these can be found in oncology populations, but they can also be found in other populations, such as your HIV AIDS population, which also have a similar process occur. Um, as a result of this muscle wasting and cachexia and wasting syndrome and unintended weight loss, this leads to malnutrition in these oncology patients. And with that, about 20 to 80% of cancer patients develop malnutrition at some point during their illness. So it's a very prevalent occurrence that malnutrition actually occurs in cancer patients. And that's why we're discussing this today. In regards to the pathophysiology, what I really want you to take away from this slide is basically the net effects of what happens whenever you introduce um, an on oncologic process to a patient. So say if a patient has a tumor or some kind of oncologic process, essentially that tumor is going to stimulate many different pathways within the body. One way that the tumor actually works is that it'll actually stimulate um, the brain to essentially um, signal the person not to eat as much and essentially they will not get as much calorie intake. That's one specific um, direct mechanism that occurs. Um, another way that anorexia happens through cancer is through the stimulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. And these essentially all um, contribute to systemic inflammation. As a result of contributing to that systemic inflammation, eventually that leads to anorexia as well. So there's essentially two pathways to anorexia in this case. It also leads to other processes in the body such as increased thermogenesis, increased lipolysis or essentially lipid or fat breakdown, and increased lipid utilization. So that's essentially how we see patients essentially lose fat stores um, during cancer is through increased thermogenesis, increased lipolysis, and increased lipid utilization. Some other processes that actually occur related to the liver include an increase in acute phase proteins, um, decreases in drug clearance, and um, obviously if you have decreases in drug clearance through the liver, especially if that drug is hepatically metabolized, then you will essentially see an accumulation of that drug and then further toxicity. So you have to be very careful with your um, cancer patients because they may have alterations in their hepatic function. Um, these can also lead to muscle wasting, um, and this is essentially due to a protein, anabolic, and catabolic imbalance. So essentially, um, the energy that you are using and the energy that you are taking in is essentially misbalanced. Um, and as a result, you essentially see loss of muscle mass, loss of muscle strength, and increased fatigue in these cancer patients. 
Um, in addition, another process that occurs is fat depletion, which we see here. Um, so like we talked about earlier, you had increased lipolysis that we also see up here, increased lipid mobilization, and potentially some lipogenesis, though it's really patient-specific about whether that occurs. So essentially, this interrelates with the impairment and hepatic function that occurs with our patients who have cancer, but also overall to systemic inflammation. So essentially what I want you to take from this slide is that inflammation plays a big role in regards to um, cancer patients' nutrition status. So kind of relating to that last slide, factors leading to nutrition deterioration in oncology. So those include anorexia. So as we discuss patients, if they do not take in enough um, dietary intake within their diet, they will potentially become malnourished. Um, taste disturbances is, is another problem in cancer. In cancer, sometimes patients' taste um, buds are altered such that certain foods do not taste the same way anymore. And that eventually leads to patients not being able to, or not wanting to eat um, foods that they normally ate before. Um, in some regards, some patients may also have an early feeling of feeling full or early satiety um, or satiety, um, which just basically means that they just feel full earlier. So they might take in a very little amount, like maybe a couple of bites. However, that couple of bites will actually make them full. As we talked about earlier, there are many inflammatory and catabolic mediators relating to nutrition deterioration in oncology. And of course, the oncolo oncologic treatments related to cancer can also influence nutritional status. Um, and those oncologic treatments are chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. We've talked about surgery previously and basically how there is a lot of muscle wasting and protein loss post-surgery um, when we talked about nutrition and surgery and gastro gastrointestinal disorders. Um, in relation to chemotherapy and radiation, these therapies can be very toxic to a patient and do direct damage to the GI tract. Um, as well as um, other bodily processes um, within the body. And that may prevent patients from being able to take in nutrition adequately. In some cases, chemotherapy may be highly emetogenic, or essentially what that means is it might cause significant amounts of nausea and vomiting where patients might not want to take in food. And that's completely understandable given the... Um, the complexity and toxicities of the drugs that may be given as chemotherapy. Obviously, certain types of chemotherapy are more highly emetogenic or cause more nausea and vomiting than others. For the purposes of this class, I'm not going to expect you to know which ones are highly emetogenic versus moderately emetogenic versus low um, emetogenic, but I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind whenever you see a, um, a cancer patient that they may have um, alterations in their regular oral diet, um, which may eventually lead to malnutrition. So in, in regards to nutrition options in oncology, we have a few different options. Obviously, as we've discussed before in this class, you have options of oral diet, um, enteral nutrition, and parental nutrition. But in, in oncology patients, because their appetite may not be as stimulated related to the inflammatory processes we talked about earlier, you may also see pharmacological therapy used for patients who have cancer and who are at high risk of malnutrition or are, are already malnourished. Some pharmacological options that are used for cancer include hormones and appetite stimulants. In regards to the hormones, the hormones don't tend to be actually used much. One hormone that exists um, to essentially um, help out with appetite is ghrelin, though that is rarely used. Also, melatonin can be used and has some data behind it in regards to cancer. Um, however, as we know, melatonin is typically used as a sleep aid, usually for sleep onset insomnia. 
the main therapies that are used for cancer in terms of nutrition um, are appetite stimulants. And the ones that you see bolded here are probably the most commonly used appetite stimulants. And basically, you can remember each of these agents um, as the three M's, um, mirtazapine, marinol, or dronabinol and progestins, um, including magesterol um, and medroxyprogesterone. Um, and magesterol is essentially just magase, um, is the brand name. As you see here on the slide, this is just an example. Um, as we know, mirtazapine is essentially an antidepressant agent, and that is one um, agent specifically that can help stimulate weight gain. Um, cannabinoids such as dronabinol, brand name Marinol, can stimulate appetite um, as well, as well as the progestin agents. Um, in regards to how these agents are actually used in regards to appetite stimulation, many times um, mirtazapine will be the first go-to um, in regards to appetite stimulation in cancer. And usually after that, um, dronabinol and then magase or magesterol may be used. Those are typically um, the three big ones. Um, in regards to some um, side effects of these medications, obviously you see potentially weight gain with all three of them. Um, in, re um, in relation to the progestins, um, if they are co in combination with an estrogen product, for example, um, obviously your patient will have an increased risk of clotting. It's not usually due to the progestin component, it's usually due to the estrogen component. And in regards to cannabinoids, depending on where you practice, um, will actually um, dictate whether or not cannabinoids are actually legal in your jurisdiction. Um, dronabinol is a synthetic cannabinoid. Um, and as a result is used in many different jurisdictions. However, um, other cannabinoids can potentially be used as well, but again, you have to make sure that you are aware of which jurisdiction you are in. In California, um, things are relatively open in regards to um, usage of cannabinoid um, products. However, you have to remember federal law prohibits the use um, of, lo of a lot of cannabinoid-related products. Some other appetite stimulants you may use are corticosteroids, anabolic steroids such, such as oxandrolone, um, cyproheptadine, which is an agent that's not really used very much, and then olanzapine, which as you know is a second generation antipsychotic that has probably the highest risk of metabolic disturbances and metabolic side effects associated with it in regards to the second generation antipsychotics. Um, so any of these agents can be used. Typically, mirtazapine, again, is probably used first line uh, with dronabinol and magesterol used after that um, in the event that patients need appetite stimulation um, or um, essentially a weight gain. In regards to nutrition impact symptoms, there are many different symptoms that patients with cancer actually have, and these can be, late, be related to the disease process itself or even in regards to the, um, the treatments that the patient is actually receiving. So these are pretty much a lot of drugs that you are probably already familiar with. Um, in terms of pain, um, opioids are used a lot in cancer patients, um, as well as some antidepressants, um, particularly um, TCAs and the SNRIs, such as duoxetine, um, also known as Cymbalta, and venlafaxine, also known as Effexor. The SNRIs are really good agents to help um, with neuropathic pain, as well as the TCAs. Um, some anticonvulsants can be used as well, such as gabapentin and pregabalin. Again, these are used for um, basically pain that is neurogenic in nature. Um, corticosteroids can be used for pain, um, as well as topical um, agents such as lidocaine that can numb the areas. You also have obviously non-opioid analgesics such as Tylenol or acetaminophen as well as your NSAIDs that are available. In regards to antiemetics, these are probably some of the um, most common agents that you'll probably see in regards to use in cancer patients. 
Um, and there are different combinations of antiemetic regimens that are used depending on the type of chemotherapy regimen. Again, I'm not going to expect you to know necessarily which um, antiemetic regimen goes with which chemotherapy regimen. But I just want you to be aware that these drugs exist and they are used for nausea and vomiting. So things such as your neurokinin 1 antagonist, such as aprepotent, fosaprepotent, your serotonin agonist, um, zofran or ontansetron, granansetron, and dolacetron, du corticosteroids such as de dexamethasone, um, atyp atypical antipsychotics such as olanzapine, Benzodiazepine such as lorazepam, thanothiazine such as promethazine, and typical antipsychotics such as haloperidol. Reglan or metoclopramide can also be used. Um, in patients who have intolerances and essentially diarrhea um, that results in diarrhea, you can use um, any of these agents, loperamide, um, diphenoxylate, um, atropine, or essentially lamotyl, and octreotide. Constipation, you can typically use um, some kind of laxative if the constipation is um, related to use of pain medication such as opioid agonists. We tend to use stimulant laxatives such as Senna or Bisacodyl with a stool softener, um, which is essentially docusate. You can also use other um, specialty agents such as methyl naltrexone or Relistor for an opioid agonist. And in patients that have fatigue related to cancer um, or cancer treatment, you can use methylphenidate or modalphenil. In regards to energy expenditure in cancer, it depends on many different factors. One of the biggest factors is the type of cancer that the patient has. Um, some cancers have higher energy expenditure related um, compared to others. Um, and some cancers may have higher energy expenditure compared to a normal patient versus other cancer which may have lower energy expenditure. For example, lung cancer actually has a higher energy expenditure than a lot of the other types of cancers um, and higher energy expenditure compared to normal patients. Um, so it's very variable in regards to the type of cancer that the patient actually has. Um, early investigations indicated a higher than normal energy expenditure in oncology patients. However, again, it's not consistent because all cancers are different. Um, however, resting energy expenditure is increased in many cancer patients, but not all. Um, this is due to the fact that many patients with advanced cancers have reduced physical activity and are not able to do our normal activities of daily living. So if they're not able to move around much, the resting energy expenditure actually decreases. Um, and as a result of your resting energy expenditure decreasing, your total energy expenditure whenever you factor in thermogenesis and activity is also decreased compared to normal. Um, so that's just in a majority of cancer patients. What I want you to really get from this slide is that energy expenditure is different in all cancer patients. It may be lower than normal, it may be the same as a normal patient without cancer, or it may be higher than a normal patient. In regards to energy expenditure in oncology, um, the ESPEN guidelines, which is the European Society for Parental and Entero Nutrition, actually has the guidelines related to energy expenditure in oncology that are most recent. Their guidelines recommend that total energy expenditure of cancer patients, if not measured individually, such as by indirect calorimetry, which remember is our gold standard, um, should be assumed to be near healthy subjects and is generally ranging between 25 and 30 kilocals per kilo per day. So our typical 25 per to 30 kilocals per kilo is usually a good estimate for most of these patients. Though some patients, like we said, may require lower or higher energy needs depending on the cancer type as well as the patient-specific factors of your patient. Um, so in regards to individual patients, what their essentially future areas of research are to um, improve prediction of these energy requirements in individual patients. In regards to protein requirements, um, they recommend in the ESPEN guidelines that protein intake should be at least 1 gram per kilo per day up to 1.5 grams per kilo per day. Now remember that this can be obviously trumped if a patient is in the ICU where they can go all the way up to 2 grams per kilo per day. Again, this is patient specific. Um, you may go up to higher amounts 
of protein depending on the degree of muscle wasting in your patient um, as well as the degree of cachexia in your patient. If they're losing lots of weight over time you may want to max it out at the highest um, amount of protein that you can give safely. Um, there are questions for research um, in um, the future is basically to look at clinical outcomes of increased supply of protein um, and the composition of those proteins and amino acids that they're providing to cancer patients. The last topic we'll talk about is nutrition and palliative care oncology. Um, and this is, you know, not the most fun topic to talk about as um, palliative care is obviously a very serious topic and is obviously very highly debatable and controversial. Um, because patients with advanced cancers usually may not have very long time to live or may have some kind of terminal amount of time to live in some cases, um, they actually do not benefit from nutritional intervention. And that's just related to the fact that if you think about it, essentially the cancer may be progressing and the cancer is essentially what's going to cause the patient to pass away. So unless you fix the underlying problem, which in this case is the cancer or the malignant process, your patients that have advanced cancers don't usually benefit from nutritional intervention as that's not necessarily correcting the underlying problem. So there's no significant difference in nutrition status, survival, or quality of life. Whenever you're looking at palliative care patients, you have to consider the wishes of the patient and or the family, whoever has essentially the power of attorney. Um, and that depends obviously on the laws of whatever um, jurisdiction that you're in, um, depending on the state or country that you're in. Um, you have to look at the potential risk and benefits of the intervention, um, as well as your patient's prognosis for survival. If their prognosis is relatively poor, um, it can be very debatable about what you do about these patients. Um, in palliative care settings, a lot of times we usually discontinue any kind of restricted diets and just let patients eat normally. Because remember, at that point, there's no significant difference in regards to nutritional intervention. Um, so in regards to discontinuing any kind of restrictions, um, say if they are on a salt um, restricted diet because they have some kind of heart disease like heart failure for example, we're going to discontinue that in our palliative care patients and those who essentially are going on to hospice potentially. Um, because essentially at that point their potential lifespan is limited at that point. And at that point it's um, probably best that they just take in um, whatever intake that they feel comfortable taking in because essentially we're restricting those diets um, originally to you know treat something or to you know improve an outcome and in these ca um, patients in a lot of cases sometimes their outcomes cannot be improved even if we provide them the, with the most adequate amount of nutrition. They may still potentially have a lot of inflammatory processes going on and just continue losing weight continually and continually. We also want to make sure that we discontinue all unnecessary medications whenever we go towards the palliative care um, and hospice route. So things such as anticholinergic agents, um, that may, you know, cause patient discomfort, they may cause patient drowsiness or constipation, um, you might want to discontinue those medications. Say if you're going to essentially hospice or treating a patient with palliative care, you might also, you know, discontinue other medications such as patients' blood pressure medications, for example. As we remember, those are usually to improve an outcome. And in these patients, we're just trying to essentially make them comfortable. Here are the references for this talk today. And if you have any questions regarding nutrition and oncology, please feel free to contact me. Thank you and have a great day.